Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Autism Risk Coalition. My name is Enrique. I'm one of the panelists that collaborate here uh, at the Autism Risk Coalition, man. and I'm joined today by our good, good friend, Dr. James Adams. Dr. Adams, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, we're very, very excited about hearing all the news about the, the, the patent uh, that was recently issued. Uh, so I'm just going to give uh, people a, a brief introduction about your very extensive and very impressive background. But um, just so you know, you, you need no introduction. But for those of you that may not be familiar with, with your work, uh, Dr. James Adams is the director of the Autism and Asperger's Research Program at Arizona State University. Uh, he works in conjunction with physicians, nutritionists, biochemists, and others. Uh, and his research is focused on the causes uh, and treatment of autism across the lifespan. Uh, Dr. Ramos believes the addition of research-based biomedical therapy to, treatment, to treat individuals with autism spectrum disorder can certainly improve the, the effectiveness of ongoing educational therapeutic and uh, behavioral interventions. Uh, Dr. Adams has a PhD in materials engineering and for the last 20 years has focused uh, his research on the biological causes of autism and how to treat it. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed scientific articles, including over 50 on autism. He has led uh, many, many clinical uh, trials, including nutritional supplementation, microbiota transplant, and detoxification and and you know clearly also you are the um the the you know the the inventor uh of these uh you know uh, of these uh patents so so we want to hear all about it uh dr adams uh so i just want to just for a brief intro on the patent uh today we're, we're going to be discussing the recently issued patent 11 uh, 357 801 b2 uh, it was issued last month, on about a month ago, on June 14, 2022, with inventors Dr. Adams uh, Daiwo Kang and Rosa Krachmalnik uh, Brown on behalf of Arizona State University. So let's get right to it, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Adams. I understand this patent is actually a secondary uh, patent to yet another patent that, that you uh, that was granted before to you and your team. Uh, so would you please, you know, uh, you know, walk us through what is covering these patents and, and why is this important for, for the autism community? Sure. So we did file a patent and had it approved a few months ago. Uh, so the first patent was on the general treatment of microbiota transplant for um, children and adults with autism who have gastrointestinal problems. So this involved our novel use of vancomycin, followed by a bowel cleanse, followed by uh, microbiota uh, uh, capsules from very healthy uh, donors. And we found that this is very effective for treating both GI problems and also for reducing autism symptoms. So the first patent is on the treatment method, the method uh, we developed, and again, not just myself, but quite a few of my colleagues too, um, in which we developed this novel method and demonstrated in the phase one trial with the FDA that it was beneficial. Um, but again, that was an open label study. And now in, we also uh, just had approved a second patent. The second patent has to do with the change in the composition of the microbiome. So our, M our MTT treatment resulted in a major change in the microbiome, major change in several uh, gut bacteria, especially Prevotella and several related gut bacteria. And so we filed a patent saying that any of a variety of methods that were used to change those gut bacteria could be useful for both treating gut problems and for treating autism symptoms. So the, having patents is very useful in that it gives you the exclusive rights to this treatment and that's important for us because we want to, we've now licensed these patents to Finch Therapeutics. And that's a publicly traded company that is focusing on developing microbiome treatments for Clostridium difficile and also for autism and other treatments. So pharmaceutical companies only want to invest if you have patents. And so it's very important that we were able to successfully obtain these patents because then that means that pharmaceutical companies will be more likely to want to invest in bringing these treatments to market. So it's not that this is an approval by the FDA. So the patent doesn't mean that we can market it now, rather it means that we have the exclusive rights to market it when it is approved by the FDA. So I hope that gives a quick, clear summary, but I'm happy to answer any questions about that. 
yeah i guess i guess the the immediate question is uh, and you 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 already touched on it but um like can you describe how could these uh obtaining these patents uh you know help to actually get fda approval i mean what what are the different you know hurdles that we need to pass i mean from now from now on uh you know for these treatments you know using fecal microbiome preparations uh, for autism in the U.S. So how, how will this process work and what are the next steps uh, so we can get an understanding of, you know, what's what's coming? So the patent process is separate from the FDA approval process. There are two different branches of the government. So the patent means that the person who holds the patent has the right to um, the use of that patent. And so that would mean that only groups that choose to license a patent from us can go ahead and use microbiota transplant for the treatment of autism. And the reason we wanted to have that patent is then that will interest pharmaceutical companies in wanting to invest in FDA approval. So now let's talk about FDA approval. There are three steps normally to FDA approval. So first you do a phase one study to demonstrate safety. And that's what we did several years ago. We demonstrated not only safety, but we also demonstrated in an open label study, meaning everyone got the treatment, we demonstrated 80% reduction of GI symptoms and initially 25% reduction of autism symptoms. And two years later, it was almost 50% reduction. There's some placebo effect, so it's probably not that much. Um, but still substantial. So that's a phase one study. We're now doing phase two studies with funds that we receive from the federal government and funds we receive from autism families and foundations. And those are randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies, <clears throat> one study for adults with autism, one study for children with autism. The study for adults with autism, we've now completed treatment and we're now evaluating the results, and we hope to report on those after we finish the analysis. And then we'll also be working on submitting those results to the FDA. And um, then in addition, we're running a study for children with autism. We have now have um, uh, almost 30 children who have been treated or in the process of being treated, and we have a few more to go. And so um, then when those two studies are completed, and then we will submit those results to the FDA and ask them, can we now apply for phase three approval, um, a, approval to do a phase three study? And a phase three study is just like a phase two study, randomized, double blind, placebo controlled. But the difference is that it's usually about 10 times larger and therefore about 10 times more expensive. And so, if these studies show good benefit, as we hope they will, then we'll need to raise much more money to do the phase three studies. And pharmaceutical companies would only be willing to do that if we have patents for them. And so the good news is we do have patents and we've licensed them to a company which is interested. And so if these phase two studies go well, then we will um, be able to continue on to phase three. That's normally how the FDA process works. <clears throat> I can explain a shortcut in a moment, but let me just pause there and see if that was clear or if anyone needs more explanation. No, I think that, that was clear. So, so what I'm gathering from what you're saying, Dr. Adams, is, is that there is this partnership that is that is has been secured uh, based on on this on these patents and that you're currently working with. So that is, I mean, that sounds like it's is really good news. So. Um, so I guess you know you, you can you can continue with the with the shortcut that you're referring to, and also maybe maybe also provide some idea of like you know what are the expectations in terms of timing for how soon do you think this method could get if the approval if everything goes well of course but you know go ahead yeah so <clears throat> normally it takes quite a few years to complete studies and to win FDA approval so if our phase two study goes well um, and we're analyzing the results now, and we'll submit those results to the FDA, FDA and ask for permission to do phase three studies. Um, and so that's probably a year or more away for permission to start phase three studies, probably take a couple years to do them. 
If those studies are successful, then we apply for FDA approval, and that's about a one-year review process. So it's still probably about four years or so away through the normal FDA approval process. There are two shortcuts that we're working on. And so uh, these shortcuts are not guaranteed, but we are very hopeful about them. So one shortcut is the FDA has what is called an expanded access policy, what's sometimes known as compassionate care informally. And we have applied for that to the FDA, um, saying we think this is a very promising treatment and would you consider letting families use this before it's fully approved? And the answer from the FDA was not yet. We'd like to see the results of those phase two studies. And so we hope when we send them the results of these phase two studies, they may be willing to allow us to have some limited number of cases of compassionate care outside of our studies. So that's one option. The second approach we're working with is we're working with a, a condition uh, called Pitt-Hopkins, which is a very rare single gene disorder. It's one of the single genes that can cause autism, and but it also causes severe physical and uh, mental challenges. And so these kids have very severe autism, generally very severely physically and mentally impaired. Many of them are in wheelchairs. Um, and so we've just completed a clinical trial of our microbiota transplant, essentially the same treatment we did for children with autism. But the kids with Pitt-Hopkins are even more severe, as I said, and they also have very severe constipation because they have very weak muscles. We think that also relates to why they have very weak peristalsis, or very weak muscles that affect movement of stool through the intestines. And we published a study six months ago showing they have a very high level of a very nasty bacteria called um, uh, C. bolte, Clostridium bolte, actually named after an autism mum because it was first discovered in children with autism. So kids with autism have very high levels of this nasty Clostridia, and kids with Pitt Hopkins have even higher levels of this very nasty Clostridia. And so we demonstrated in our study, there was a small study, Pitt Hopkins is very rare with only 500 kids. So we've demonstrated in this study that um, the treatment group improved more than the placebo. And when the placebo group was switched to the real treatment, they improved as well. So the bottom line is big improvements in their GI symptoms, big reduction in their pain, which was a huge factor in their quality of life and surprisingly, some good improvements in other areas like language, et cetera. The reason I bring this up is that for very rare conditions like Pitt Hopkins, the FDA gives an example. If you show improvement in just three out of 12 children, that's enough for them to consider FDA approval. And so we saw improvement in five out of six kids. So the question we're going to be asking the FDA very soon as we put the package together is this improvement in five out of six kids better than improvement in three out of 12? And that's the question we'll ask the FDA. And the FDA may say, well, yes, it's better improvement if you did another six kids. And even if none of those improved, that's still five out of 12. But six kids is not very many. We'd like you to do more. The problem, the reason we had to limit the number of kids in this study is the kids with Pitt Hopkins are so physically limited very few of them could swallow pills. So we're now working on a liquid formulation that they could swallow, and we plan to do a follow-up study with that. So we're looking at two shortcuts, one a compassionate care option, one an option uh, for getting approval for Pitt Hopkins. And once a drug is approved, then uh, it's possible that physicians could consider a uh, use of it uh, for other conditions. Um, so that's a quick summary of, of where we are and our approaches with the FDA. Any questions on that? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, I guess I guess that there's this shortcut uh, for for this the specific uh, cohort uh, of you know individuals that have this specific gene. I guess the the question uh, about like you know how soon do we do we expect that 
if everything goes well, uh, the treatment could become available at some point. I mean, do, do you have any any idea uh, or, a, or a rough estimate of how, how long that would probably take? That route, route could be a bit sooner, could be two to three years. Um, and, um, and the compassionate care could be six to 12 months. Again, it depends on the FDA and their uh, view. But the compassionate care would probably be fairly limited at first as to how many people they would allow. That is that is super exciting uh, news. So I mean, we're we're all going to be cheering for you, Dr. Adams, <laughs> on that one. So yeah. that is, yeah. Go ahead. One of the challenges we have with the Pitt Hopkins project is that uh, because it's very rare, it's be a small market. So we do need to raise in the next few months about a half million dollars to do the next study. Um, we're excited because this is the first clinical trial ever done for children with Pitt Hopkins, and it showed good success. And so um, we are now working with the Pitt Hopkins Research Foundation, but if other people are interested in making donations, that could help us, or um, uh, that would help us with um, bringing that to um, a second trial uh, much sooner and hopefully getting it approved by the FDA sooner. Yeah, so I, I guess I guess a, a question that, you know, that I, I've seen or, you know, people were asking in preparation for this, which I think is, is timely at this at this moment is uh, how does how does the treatment covered in this in this patent compared to to other treatments of its kind? Right. So there's a reason you 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 got this patent and, and I suppose it is actually in, in the preparation that you were describing. But if you could uh, summarize, you know, you know, briefly. Uh, you know, what, what is exactly uh, what was patented and, and why is it like a, a, a differentiated approach versus other treatments of its kind? So there's several things that are different. Um, one of the major differences is that um, when you're looking at C. diff, so microbiota transplant, or commonly called fecal transplant, is widely used for treating C. diff infections. And the difference there is C. diff infections are very easy to treat relatively speaking, that one dose, one time is enough to um, cure the symptoms of this life-threatening diarrhea and to cure it typically within two to three days with about 90% success rate. Even better than that, if you're treated a C. diff infection with antibiotics, about 30 to 40% of the time it will return and the person just gets weaker and weaker until they die if they can't fight it off. But with um, fecal transplant, not only does it cure it, but it's almost unheard of for it to ever recur. So you're cured almost, almost always, it seems, for life, or at least for a very long time. And that's what we've seen in our uh, microbiota transplant study for autism. We found that not only were we able to treat the GI symptoms, but two years later, um, almost all of the children we're doing very, very uh, well, uh, much better in terms of their autism symptoms. And most of the GI benefits were continuing. There's one child who had antibiotics and they lost their GI benefits. Um, so that's one of the major differences is that for C. diff, you one dose, one time. We knew it was much harder to treat and we knew children with autism on general, probably had not one pathogen, but a variety of pathogens. So that's why we pre-treated with vancomycin for two weeks to kill off harmful bacteria. It's a very powerful antibiotic, but a great advantage of it is it's very safe because it doesn't get into the rest of the body. It's not absorbed to any significant amount into the rest of the body. The next novel thing we did is we used a, a fasting followed by bowel cleanse. We used fasting plus a bowel cleanse to remove as much of the gut bacteria as possible. Roughly 30 to 50% of a person's stool is gut bacteria. And so you might normally have a pound or so of gut bacteria in you. And so you need we want to remove all of that because a lot of that is bad gut bacteria. And so what we want to do is when we give new gut bacteria, we want to have very little competition. So the second novel piece was our um, uh, doing the bowel cleanse, followed the fasting plus the bowel cleanse. And the third novel piece was not doing just one dose. We actually used, um, uh, depending on the format, for the oral dosing, we used high dosing uh, three times a day for two days. 
and then we did daily dosing every day for eight weeks. And that was what our collaborator, Thomas Perotti, had found, a gastroenterologist in Australia. He found kids with autism were one of the hardest groups to treat with microbiota transplant, and he's treated over 15,000 people in his clinic. He said autism is just one of the hardest. He had to treat every day for three months, and then he found the improvements in GI symptoms, and surprisingly to him, the improvement in autism symptoms. So this, the gut bacteria in kids with autism, I think the takeaway message is it's not a transient infection. It is a very well-established infection that is very difficult to remove. And that's where we're so lucky that the, this treatment uh, method that we developed based on Dr. Brody's work ended up being very effective. But we still have a lot more to learn about optimal dosing, how much to give, how frequently to give, the good news is so far it's very safe. If a medication is very safe and it has some benefit, why not give more of it? So that's what we're doing in this phase two study is we're giving more of the medication, we're giving it for longer, and we're seeing, hoping that we may see even more benefit. That is, uh, yeah, thank you for that description. That is a, a very nice summary of, of, the, of the treatment and what's, what, is, uh, what is different about this uh, treatment versus, versus other uh, you know, transplant approaches. Um, I, I guess w one thing that you mentioned about P Pete uh, Hopkins syndrome, which is, I, I guess it begs the question about like what subgroups or what kinds of, you know, uh, people with autism could be uh, more likely or would be most most helped, uh, you know, by these kinds of treatments. So do, do you have, uh, besides Pete, Pete Hopkins, are, is there any anything else, uh, any other, uh, biomarkers, any other uh, indicators that could help us to, you know, uh, see, you know, which groups of people could be most, um, you know, these students would be most beneficial for? Yeah, it's a great question. And the answer is we don't know yet that our first study was too small. When you have 18 children and 16 to 17 out of 18 got better, you, you can, there's not much to say about why did the one out of 18 not get better. So if, if almost everyone improved, that doesn't give you much insight as to who is likely to improve. It makes you think almost everyone with autism and GI symptoms would be likely to improve. What we didn't know about the kids with Pitt Hopkins is because they were more severe. They have very bad constipation. They're in great pain. The, the director of the Pitt Hopkins Research Foundation says this is the central quality of life, life issue for them. It's just great constant pain. Uh, or great pain throughout the day, not necessarily constant. Um, and we, and also we knew because their muscle strength is so low that um, the concern is that if you don't have enough high enough muscle strength, then that may be part of the reason for the constipation. Plus, many of these kids are in wheelchairs, and even if they can walk, they walk very little. And so, if you don't walk much, just low physical activity will tend to cause constipation. So our fear was that the treatment might work temporarily, but then would fade when the children were not moving much or still had weak muscles. To our pleasant surprise, so far at the end of the study, and even three months after treatment stopped, the kids were still doing very well and those GI benefits were continuing. So um, all I can say is in our current child and adult studies, we're trying to understand who does and doesn't improve and we'll learn a lot from those studies. Uh, I'm just going to ask you something, uh, ju just a clarifying question for 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 those that are watching. So um, they, they just want to understand the the basic difference between this approach versus fecal transplants as, as we currently mm -hmm. know them. So you know you have explained this multiple times, but I'm I'm just going to um, you know ask you to to please clarify this quickly, you know, so that we're yeah. not confused about the, the terminology. Right. We chose to use the term microbiota transplant therapy to distinguish it from a fecal transplant that's normally used for treating C. diff infections. So C. diff infections are a nasty bacterial infection, primarily caught by people who are elderly or in nursing homes. It causes life-threatening, explosive diarrhea. So it just gets everywhere and infects other people. So that's why it's, once someone gets it in a hospital or nursing home, it's very contagious. Um, it causes life-threatening diarrhea, affects about a half million people in the US, 
and kills or used to kill about 29,000 people a year. But it was discovered that just one dose of um, microbiota, of gut bacteria, or even just raw human stool put into a person will cure them about 90% of the time. You could give it to them through a colonoscopy. You could mix it in water or saline and give it as a rectal enema. Or you could give it through a nasal gastric tube down the throat into the stomach. And all three methods work well and we're able to have a very high cure rate for C. diff. And so even though it's not yet approved by the FDA, the FDA is allowing it to be used. It's being used in over 700 hospitals. Over 50,000 people have been treated and had their lives saved from these horrible C. diff infections. But microbiota transplant, we use that term because we found that one dose, one time, is not nearly enough for most kids with autism. So we developed this therapy to first kill off the bad bacteria with vancomycin. So analogy I like to give, it's like having a garden filled with weeds, a garden, your gut is filled with bad gut bacteria. So first we wanna pluck out those weeds and that's why we use the vancomycin to kill off the harmful bacteria. But if we stop there, those harmful bacteria would just regrow. So the second thing we wanna do is the bowel cleanse and the um, fasting to remove as much remaining bacteria as possible. So, to remain, so there's very little to reseed the gut. So we wanna not just get rid of the weeds, but get rid of their seeds, if you will. And then finally, our treatment is to give high dose microbiota transplant, but not just one time, but to give high dose and then follow it every day for two to three months. Um, so that way, not only are we replanting it, but if some of it uh, doesn't uh, attach and engraft, then there's still more and more constantly flooding the gut. And so it's essentially a super probiotic. And by having much more of that than other harmful bacteria, we just hope to overwhelm by numbers and uh, help prevent bad bacteria from growing. So those are the three differences. Use, use of the vancomycin, use of the bowel cleanse and fasting, and not just one dose, but high dose, and then continuing every day for two to three months. Yeah, and, and if I understand correctly, this is also like a highly purified uh, version of the of the bacteria that is extracted. So it's not raw, raw uh, fecal material, as you mentioned. Um, right. The other so, thing I should point out too, is not only is it highly purified, we test very carefully to make sure it doesn't have any pathogens in it. And the donors, we're very, very careful about the donors. My collaborators at the University of Minnesota run a very strict donor program. 95% of the U.S. population would not qualify. So we take the top 5% healthiest people, and I think that also is a reason why we're successful. I would like to ask you something a little bit technical, uh, Dr. Adams. So, so as I read, as I read the patent, the, the patent description, uh, so it, it it uses like very very specific language to obtain the patent, and, and it says that, that uh, you know it we're basically what what we're giving these uh, the patients is a therapeutically effective amount of a pharmaceutical composition. Uh, so so that means that there's uh, you know like enough. Uh, you know, fecal microbiome preparation to achieve, it says, at least a twofold change of the abundance of like the organisms that you want to, to cause an effect on. Um, so, so I guess that the question is like, how do you, how do you determine the right amount uh, for each patient uh, to achieve this twofold change in the abundance? Uh, is that, is there, is that something that you could um, tell us about that? How, how, how would we ensure that that is possible? Yeah. So the answer is at the moment, we use what's called a full spectrum product. So it contains all of the gut bacteria from healthy human donors, very healthy, exceptionally healthy human donors. We, the world does not know, the world scientists do not know what are the best bacteria um, or the best combination of bacteria. And so the best way to think about it is that um, some bacteria can be pathogens if they're too high a level. Um, and so you need to, you want to have the right balance of bacteria in a person's gut. So a good, a good analogy to use, if you have a village and a village has, um, you know, 10 farmers, but no doctors, they're going to be very vulnerable to infections. But if a village has 
nine farmers and one doctor, that might be pretty good. But if it has one farmer and nine doctors, that's probably not a very good balance for the village to survive. So individual bacteria are beneficial, but the challenge is having the right balance of those. And so commercial probiotics in principle are the right idea, but in practice, commercial probiotics, almost all of them, are bacteria that grow in milk culture in air, and they are not bacteria that generally seed the human gut. So part of our patent was to use a full spectrum product, which we demonstrated had major effects on major categories of bacteria, such as bifidobacteria and Prevotella, um, which uh, was associated with very healthy human guts. And also we found anti-correlated with a level of a variety of pathogens. Mm. That is that is very helpful. So thank you, thank you for the description. Um, uh, th there is uh, multiple people that are asking, how can they uh, enroll in the upcoming uh, clinical trials? Is there any way that that that, that we can sign up our kids for future studies? Uh, you know, some some people are asking. So, so you know, do, do you have an, any information to provide at this point? Yeah. So on our website, um, autism.asu.edu, we have a sign up list so people can sign up to be added to our email list. And so um, we send out emails regularly to our email list group, which continues to grow. Um, and so, uh, again, the, I just want to caution people. We get emails every day from people who want to be in our next studies. And we just have very limited numbers of slots because these are very, very expensive studies to do. So we would love to accommodate everyone. But for a child study, we had 1,400 applications for 50 slots. And that was in just 10 days. And then we closed applications. Um, we were just inundated with phone calls and emails. So, you know, I'm sorry, we're doing the best we can to um, enroll people who qualify. And then we hope to um, go ahead and uh, ultimately get this treatment approved so that everyone who has a child with autism can have this treatment available to them. And if it get, becomes FDA approved, then we hope it would be covered by insurance as well, because it is a somewhat expensive therapy. Uh, one of our rock star moms, uh, Dana Woods, just posted the the website. That was kind of, <laughs> I was figuring out a way, autism.asu.edu. That's, that's where we can find additional information for these um, studies. And, um, and, you know, but obviously, you know, it, there's a, there's a limit to how many people can, can enroll. Um, Dr. Adams, I know that you, um, you know, you, you wanted also to, to share, uh, with, uh, the, with the Autism Research Coalition audience, uh, about the, the new app that you have, which looks great. And I would like to, to give folks the opportunity to take a look at this and why don't, why don't you go ahead and walk us through, uh, the new app that you just launched and, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about it. So I'm going to show uh, my screen uh, so we can walk through it. Yeah. So this is a new app we created about a month ago. We released it about a month ago. It's a free app available on iPhones. We hope to have the Android version available in a few months later. But it just takes time. Uh, this is an app that's meant to rate a wide range of autism treatments. It's based on uh, two published research study, two published papers that we did. Uh, we conducted a national survey of uh, 1200, over 1,200 autism families and asked them to rate a wide variety of treatments. So we asked them to rate a wide variety of different medications, different nutritional supplements, different diets, and different therapies. So if you can see the screen on the right, um, I don't know if you can zoom in at all, um, Enrique, if that's possible. Great, thank you. So you can see on the top, you can select medications, supplements, diets, or therapies. And then if you scroll down, um, this happens to be showing a screenshot of treatments in the sleep category. So you could click, for example, on 5-HTP, um, uh, and then it would tell you what's the benefit of it, what are the adverse effects of it, and um, what are the specific symptoms that it affects. And also we have the rating there. So the scale goes from zero to four. So 1.8 is a pretty high rating um, and that's the net benefit. So it's the benefit minus the adverse effects. And so we sorted all, all many different treatments 
uh, this way. So you can look up in the supplement category. And then also you can go into the symptoms. So Enrique, if you can scroll over a little bit to the right. Yeah. So you can also select a particular symptom. So let's say you picked uh, the symptom of emotion regulation as it shows on the right. Uh, well, no, th yeah, the second one there, uh, that's fine. So if you wanted to learn more about the best treatments for emotional regulation, then you could scroll down there and it will say, okay, here are the top three and you'll see the ratings for those. And so it says, for example, 36% of people reported that relationship development intervention helped regulate their child's uh, emotions. 35% of people said ABA helped. And then next is exercise. Exercise helps with a lot of things. It's one of the highest rated treatments. And ABA is one of the highest rated treatments. And then if you look at an individual treatment, so Enrique, if you can just scroll up a little bit, this will show you, for example, for probiotics in general. So we had 395 people rated probiotics. They use different ones. So the overall benefit score was 1.9 out of 4. That's pretty high. The overall adverse effect was very low, 0.1. And so and we found in general, most nutritional supplements have very low adverse effect ratings, except for a few. And then if you scroll down a little bit more, Enrique, Oh, no, I guess it doesn't show on this screen. But if you go to the next screen, yeah. Um, this is just a symptom screen. Sorry, if you scroll all the way to the right. This just lists um, the over 30 different symptoms. That, so you can click on any one of those 30 symptoms, and it will tell you what are the top treatments. And then finally, the rightmost screen well, for a given treatment, it will tell you which symptoms were reported as improving, so what fraction of people uh, reported an improvement of a symptom, and what fraction of people reported an adverse effect. So you'd like to know, you know, if you're taking, say, Risperdal, you'd like to be aware that it can help with some symptoms, but it can also cause weight gain and other problems. So our app gives you the uh, feedback from not just your friend, but from 1,200 people in the autism community about what their ratings are for these different treatments. So it's a very simple, but I think very powerful app. There's also a section on there which uh, talks about our ANRC treatment protocol, which involves our vitamin mineral supplement, fish oil, carnitine, and a healthy diet. So you can learn about that too. So um, there's a lot more information on the app, but I think the best way to learn it is just click on it. You can look up any medic any of a very wide variety of medications, any of a very wide variety of supplements. And also you can look up symptoms to see what are the top rated treatments for that symptom. Again, these are averages, so it doesn't mean it will be the best treatment for you, but I, I would rather, if it was me and I had a particular symptom, I would rather go with a symptom that other people say maybe treats, helps 35% of people versus a treatment that helps say 5% of people. So I think it gives you suggestions and things you can consider, talk about with your physician and nutritionist or your therapy provider and see what treatments you want to consider for your individual child. So I hope that helps. And we have published two research studies on this too. Uh, Dr. Fry helped with both of these and also uh, Dr. Dan Rosignell helped with our study on nutraceuticals. And those are published studies which give more um, insight about the research behind the app. So that's a quick summary. I hope that's helpful. That is uh, that is very exciting and and certainly a great tool. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so uh, I, we just we we have we have a lot of comments and questions, Dr. Adams. I guess I guess the one of the most important ones every time we talk about uh, you know microbiota transplant therapy or or these kinds of fecal transplant uh, you know treatments. I, I always want to give the the presenter, the, which usually in our channel is a scientist. Uh, the opportunity to share what will be some of the risks. I mean, because like sometimes, uh, you know, when parents hear to these different alternatives and, you know, the fact that these may be beneficial, they may be thinking about like doing this, you know, DIY or, 
or going to somewhere in some other place, you know, overseas uh, to do this thing. So could you please share some of the risks uh, that, that could be involved, uh, you know, for if, if not done correctly, this type of treatment, so people are aware of this? Yeah, so I want to be very clear that this is an investigational treatment. We're just doing the research studies on it now. Um, in our phase one study, it did seem to be very safe in general. But very interestingly, during the vancomycin phase, um, we found that about, it was 12 out of the, if I remember right, 12 out of 18 children uh, had some temporary adverse reactions, uh, mostly an increase in hyperactivity or an increase in irritability. Usually lasted just for one to three days, usually right at the start of the treatment and um, it was one case where it did last as long as two weeks. You have to be aware that giving vanco, what it seemed, our interpretation of what's happening is that as the vancomycin kills off the harmful bacteria, then those bacteria release all their harmful toxins all at once. So you have a temporary worsening of symptoms, and then there's improvement uh, back to baseline and then beyond there. And so that's one concern to be aware of. A study 20 years ago um, by Sandler found the same thing, that vancomycin caused temporary problems. That's very puzzling because it's not absorbed into the rest of the body. So I think that's the most plausible explanation. And also we discovered that the children who are more likely to have these die-off reactions are the kids who have worse of these behavioral symptoms to begin with. So presumably if you have more of these bad back gut bacteria causing more of these symptoms, you're probably more likely to have more of a die-off reaction initially. That's our guess. Um, and then um, the bowel cleanse is just like a bowel cleanse for a colonoscopy. It's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's probably the hardest part of the study. But in a few hours, you're over having that liquid diarrhea, and um, you may have a little bit of GI discomfort for a day or a few days. Uh, like you would have after a colonoscopy, but generally very safe. And then the microbiota itself, we have not seen any significant adverse effects from that, but there are some rare risks. There was a case of someone who received a fecal transplant after while they were on immunosuppressant drugs for organ transplant. And so um, their immune system was severely impaired because they were taking immunosuppressant drugs. And unfortunately, they received a, um, a, a microbiota transplant, a fecal transplant from someone who had a gut infection that was resistant to antibiotics. And the person who it was the donor didn't have any symptoms because they had a normal functioning immune system, was able to keep it suppressed apparently. When it got into the person with suppressed immune system, then that person became very sick and ultimately died. They couldn't treat them soon enough. So these risks are very rare. Um, out of 50, of order 50,000 cases, there's probably half a dozen cases of serious adverse effects uh, with of order one to uh, that death I mentioned. Um, so no treatment is 100% safe. But in general, I'd say this is very safe, but you should not give it to people who are on immunosuppressant drugs or have weak immune systems. And you wanna test very carefully that your donors, that's why we use very carefully selected donors. They go through all the Red Cross screening procedures just to begin with and a lot more screening beyond there. So I hope that helps. Definitely. Uh, no, and thanks a lot for clarifying that because like, you know, we don't, we definitely are not promoting uh, necessarily like the, the, the use of any any other method. Uh, we just want to communicate the fact that this is a very careful uh, and very, um, you know, scientific approach uh, to getting uh, FDA approval. So so that is definitely a, a, a really, really important consideration. Uh, I just want to share one more time the the app uh, for those that uh, are asking for it, because uh, some people miss the name of the app is ANRC uh, Autism Treatment uh, Rater uh, that and by Autism N Nutrition Research Center. Uh, currently, it is available only on Apple uh, devices, iPhone and iPad. It seems like uh, so you can download that. It's it's free of charge, as, as uh, Dr. Adams was 
uh, was telling us today. So, uh, Dr. Adams, I, I really want to appreciate your time, you know, once again for being with us. And, you know, I look forward to actually having you back, if, if, you, if you don't mind, to cover th those uh, results for the Pete Hopkins study that you did. Uh, do you have any, any last remarks for, for our audience today? I, I think that hopefully summarizes it, that we're excited about these two patents. That, that means that um, it's much more likely for pharmaceutical companies to want to continue investing uh, in get, bringing this treatment to market. Um, but again, it's a long process through the FDA and we're moving as fast as we can. COVID really slowed us down for a couple of years, uh, almost stopped us really for a couple of years, but now we're making good progress again and our adult studies finished and we're now just analyzing the results for the treatment part. We're still going to do the long-term follow-ups for that. And our child study is making good progress. So uh, we're moving ahead. Awesome. Uh, we're definitely rooting for you. Uh, once again, uh, for those that want more information, I, I'm sharing the, the comment of Dana uh, with the link uh, to the uh, website uh, where you can get more information. It is autism.asu.edu uh, for those that want to access more information. Uh, once again, Dr. Adams, this has been tremendous and it's always a pleasure to, to have you with us. I, I really want to thank you once again for everything you do for our families. And it's it's really, really greatly appreciated. So th thanks a lot for your time and for everything you do. Thank you. See you later. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.